Family, it's wonderful to see you today. For those of you that I haven't had a chance to meet, my name is Brent, and uh, I'm privileged to be one of the uh, leaders here in our church family. We're going to dismiss our children right now uh, up through sixth grade, so basically all the children can be dismissed. Parents, as Masami mentioned, over in the gym, they're doing something special in the kitchen, and then they end up with the, in the gym eating it, I think. I think, that, I think that's the plan. I'm not quite sure. But God bless all of our children's ministry workers. Amen. And if you haven't uh, taken a time lately to just thank them for what they do week in and week out and uh, even consider an opportunity you might have to serve in that area. Well, this is week number two in a very interesting series, Things We Don't Talk About in Church, and now we're talking about it. Uh, last week we talked about money and uh, So this is uh, the big one. Is everybody ready? An honest and maybe, for some, a little awkward sermon about sex. I said that in here. Ah. But why should it be awkward? I was thinking about that. Why is there any awkwardness? Our culture is saturated with sex. It's everywhere. But somehow in here, in this place, with the people of God, with the wonderful gift of God in sex, it's not talked about. I was preaching through uh, 1 and 2 Corinthians a number of years ago, and there's a few passages in there that deal very directly with the topic of sex, and one of them we'll be looking at today. And I spoke very directly about what the text communicated. It was just interesting, the response afterwards. You know, often I don't hear anything about sermons, but that sermon I heard a lot about. At both ends, like, why are you talking about that in church? Or thank you for talking about that in church. Maybe a little awkward. I was thinking about that again, and I think there's, there's a few reasons it becomes kind of awkward for us. One of those is you probably know that in Christian history, some of our, the leading voices in the church took a very negative view of sex not just outside of marriage, but even in marriage. And, and there's a history that I think we're still, as followers of Jesus, trying to put behind us. They would say sex is a hindrance to one's spiritual life. It was even evil. Let me show you just a few thoughts uh, from some of our, quote, church fathers, Justin Martyr. We Christians marry only to produce children. Now, he was a leader in the church at that point, still referred to often. Going a little, a few centuries later, John of Damascus, one that we don't refer to too much, says, Adam and Eve were created sexless. Their sin in Eden led to the horrors of sexual reproduction. If only our earliest progenitors had obeyed God, we would be procreating less sinfully now. Let that sink in. I I don't know what he has in mind for that. But again, that that was where the church was, and church leaders were communicating that. And, And even Martin Luther, who had a much more positive view about sex and marriage, said something really, really odd. The reproduction of mankind is a great marvel and mystery. Had God consulted me in the matter... I should have advised him to continue the generation of the species by fashioning them out of clay. (laughs) I read so many quotes that I just was laughing like half of a day about where we were as a church at one point in this view about sex. So we've come a long way, baby. (laughs) But we've come with a lot of baggage. We've come with a lot of baggage in this area. I also need to say in a very uh, personal note that I realize that as well, some of us come with baggage to this area and this topic because of personal baggage that has been even given to us through parents and their view of sex and even through what some of us have experienced Uh, not even of our will in this area of sex, and that has left a very hurtful, violent, and even shameful uh, lens through which we look at sex. 
So that's some of the reasons it is awkward, but yet, church, we need to hear what God says about this, amen? About every area of our lives. And the Bible is absolutely straightforward about our Creator's view of human sexuality, but also very straightforward in revealing the abuses of that throughout uh, biblical history. So would you bow with me in prayer, and we're going to ask God to just speak very clearly to us through his word. Father God, thank you for this time. Thank you for the blessing of your written word that we can just keep going back to. And it guides us, and it shapes us, and it transforms us, and it helps us to see your perspective on life, on eternity. So please, Holy Spirit, be our teacher today. For Jesus' sake. Amen. So let's go back to the very beginning. When God, our creator, designed human life and relationship, and you know the story in the book of Genesis, it's a true story, it's not a myth, it's not a fable, it tells us about God's creative work and his plan. So going back to the very beginning in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful to multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now those are familiar words, so I just want to highlight some of the aspects of it that maybe we tend to gloss over. God created man and woman. He created them male and female. They are both in the image of God, but they are uniquely different by design. Not just physically, but emotionally and mentally. They're different on purpose. We are different on purpose. We're uniquely different. And to this man and to this woman, he says, be fruitful and multiply. He created them male and female, both in his image, but uniquely different. And then he says, be fruitful and multiply. So from the very beginning, God has a plan for a man and a woman to multiply, to reproduce. And God is a great planner. He created man and woman with a beautiful uh, physical body and even emotional design to relate to one another even for the purpose of what he commanded them to do, to be fruitful and multiply. God gave them everything they needed to fulfill the command he gave them. So then as we continue in this book of beginnings and step back um, God steps back from it and looks and in verse 31 it says God saw that all he had made and behold it was what? Very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. It's like God steps back sees this man and this woman sees what he's created And it's not just good, it's what? It's very good. That's a, uh, it's just an intensive way, uh, even in our English, but even in the Hebrew, this is very, very good. He looks at the creation of man, he looks at the creation of woman, both in his image, both different. He looks at his design of them, he even looks at this command to be fruitful and multiply, and he says, this is very, very good. I like what I have done. So saying this as plain as I can, when God told Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply, he is saying, in essence, engage with one another sexually. I have created you, I've designed you to be able to do that. So a man and a woman coming together physically and in in that sexual intimacy is God's good plan. So sex is good if for no other reason than God designed it to happen and created our human bodies to experience. 
Now imagine for a moment, God didn't step back from his creation, and when he told him to be fruitful and multiply, he didn't step back and say, well, that's kind of gross, but it's the best I could do. <laughs> no, he steps back from it and said, this is good. I've done a good thing, and I've designed them perfectly to engage in this. So the very first point is actually very simple. Sex, as God designed it for a man and a woman, is not evil, it's not tainted, it's not something God had to do. He didn't have to design it that way, but he did, on purpose, for a very specific reason. And it's not just good, it's what? It's very good. But it's not just good because it's God's design for reproduction for this very functional aspect, because if we stop there, that's actually where the church fathers kind of had this brain fog and they couldn't see beyond the reproduction aspect of it. So let's move on. And the story of God's creative work is given some more detail. So let's look at the details in verse 7 of Genesis 2. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Then God, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. And then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. And the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man, and he brought her to the man. Adam's response. The man said, this is now bone of my bones. This is flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. Again, those are familiar words. Can I just point out a few things from that? So this is kind of like the detailed view. We had the snapshot in Genesis 1, and in Genesis 2 we have kind of the detailed. How did this all come about? And when he gives the details, I just want to point out some different words used in the creation of man and woman. In Genesis 2.7 and in Genesis 2.22, the Lord God, what? Formed man of dust from the ground. Genesis 2.22, the Lord God, what? Let's say it fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man. God is an amazing creator. And he made man and woman in his image, both of them, but uniquely different. So those words in the Hebrew are very different. Formed is a very basic, uh, he just made man. But he didn't do that with a woman, he fashioned the woman. It's one of the words that in other places it, it, it would be you build a city with all the details of it. Man is the basic model. <laughs> Woman is the one with all the extras. Amen. God formed man. God fashioned a woman. It's the Ford and the Ferrari, if I can say it that way. And I'm just pointing this out because, again, this is God's plan. He made us uniquely different so that we can come together in not just a sexual way, but even in emotional ways and be complemented by one another. Now, notice Adam's response at seeing Eve. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. I'm going to call her woman because she came out of me. Now, none of us were there when he said that, so we don't know what it was exactly like, but I have kind of a weird imagination sometimes. You know, remember, he'd been sleeping. He was in this deep sleep, and he wakes up, and there she is. He'd never seen her before. And he says to God, or even to himself, she's great. She's perfect. She's just what I need. See, those words that you see on the screen, those aren't 
those aren't necessarily theological words or even scientific words. I believe that's a heart response to this woman that God had designed for him. She is perfect for me. What did Eve say? We don't know what Eve said. Maybe she was actually speechless. I don't know. Again, I don't want to read into Scripture, but I'm going to assume her response as she's seeing Adam is probably the same. It's like, he's perfect. God, you've designed, you've designed us perfect for one another. And they're looking at, well, we're different. And God's saying, that's good. That's how I designed it. That's on purpose. Here's what I'm getting at, and we're going to go deeper into this here in a moment. God's design of man and woman and his plan for them to engage sexually, is, is, it's not just good because it's functional. It's not just good because it allows them to fulfill the command to be fruitful, but it's great. Because as they come together, they, they come together in that perfectly designed not just to fulfill a function, but to experience pleasure and satisfaction and enjoyment in that. And again, God has designed the human body for that. That was God's purpose. That's why he did it. He designed us this way. So his plan for sex is not just good because it's functional, it's great because it's enjoyable. I thought I might get an amen right there. I don't know. <laughs> it's not just functionally good. It's enjoyable. That means it's, it's great. It's to be a great experience. So let's go to the Song of Solomon. It's very clear there. You are altogether beautiful, my darling, and there is no blemish in you. Come with me from Lebanon, my bride. You have made my heart beat faster. My sister, my bride, you have made my heart beat faster with a single glance of your eyes, with a single strand of your necklace. How beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better is your love than wine. Let me first say that phrase, sister. This was not his literal sister. That's just a phrase that was used as an expression of endearment. So I just want you to point at point out is as this man is thinking about his wife there's obviously an expression of great desire it's not just well let's just go be fruitful to multiply because God said we should you don't see that at all it's like I am desirous of you and I will enjoy this experience but that's not just from the man's point of view. We missed this piece in the Song of Solomon. Going back to the very beginning, this is where it starts. The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's, may he kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Your oils have a pleasing fragrance. Your name is like purified oil. Therefore, the maidens love you. Draw me after you. and Let us run together. The king has brought me into his chamber. Again, there's no mention of having children in this process, but a sense of, I am desirous of you. This is enjoyable. And again, I'm, I'm trying to say that's how God intended it to be, not just functional, but enjoyable. Sex is not just good because it allows us to procreate. We could spend a lot of time on what the amazing, um, amazing thing that is. But it's great because he's, again, so designed our bodies and our emotions to engage with one another in, in sexual intimacy and enjoy it and be pleased by it and even be excited by it. A number of years ago, Kim and I had a conversation uh, with a counselor that worked with lots of couples um, and, and even in this area of, of sex and marriage, and, and this woman gave a real interesting analogy. She said, sex in marriage is like a hinge on a door. And so I'm pausing there because I, I want you to ponder, where's she going to go with that? It's like a hinge on a door. Because that was the same thing I did. I, she said, it says, ah, where are you going with that? She said, it, it's for the most part hidden from others, 
And yet the door just does not function like it should without the proper working of the hinge. I've shared that illustration often with others because both aspects are very important. The hinge is hidden. And in our culture, sex is paraded and made public, and it's an obsession for some. And yet as we think of God's plan for sex and marriage, it's obviously sex in our marriage is not meant to be the public aspect of our marriage, but it's the very important aspect of our marriage that if it's not functioning properly, the door is just not going to open the way it should. The door will not be uh, fulfilling even the purpose that it had been designed for. One more place in Proverbs just drives this home. Proverbs chapter 5, Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. As a loving hind and a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times. Be exhilarated. That word could be translated intoxicated always with her love. So understand, that's the purpose of God in sex, that there would be an exhilaration, a satisfaction, a longing for. First point, sex is good because it allows us to be uh, fruitful and multiply, but sex is great because in doing that, it can be pleasurable, and that is God's design, even physically and emotionally. So you see where we're going. It's good, it's great. So the next step is, is sex is glorious. Okay, now track with me here. It's glorious. You know, we live in such a sex-saturated culture that sex has been diminished and devalued. It's been paraded, and it's been sold, and it's been media-hyped. Sex has become a sport and a casual pastime, a competition to perform very well at. In all this focus on sex in our culture, it's gone from glorious right down to the gutter. That's where it's gone. And we've lost God's view of it. We've lost the perspective of what is actually taking place when a man and a woman come together in sexual intimacy. You know, often in the Old Testament, and even in the New Testament, God's relationship with his people is referred to as a relationship like a husband and a wife. I always thought that was amazing. And it shows God's great desire for his people. And it shows the covenant commitment that he makes to his people and that we even make to him as we come into that relationship. So how does God view it when God's people do not walk in that close relationship as they should? It's interesting, and it's even uncomfortable where Scripture goes with that. He says that when the people of God fail to walk in obedience and go after other gods and other, pursu other pursuits, that is spiritual adultery. He even says that is spiritual prostitution. And as we read these phrases, particularly in the Old Testament, it's just almost shocking. Look at this in Ezekiel. Or again, referring to the people of God in their disobedience, you trusted in your beauty and played the harlot because of your fame, and you poured out your harlotries on every passerby who might be willing. You took some of your clothes, made for yourself high places of various colors, and played the harlot on them, which should never come about nor happen. He's saying when you go after other gods and when you go in other pursuits, you're cheating on me. It's like you're playing the harlot or it's like spiritual adultery. The New Testament makes the same analogy. In the New Testament, we as the church are referred to as the bride of Christ. We've entered into a covenant relationship with him. So what is it when we walk away from him? Look at this in James chapter 4. Again, James writing to people who have done just that. He says, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility with, toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that Scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. 
So when God chooses to use a husband and wife relationship as a model or as a, as a picture of his relationship with his people, what does that reveal? Now track with me here. It reveals that God is serious about this relationship with his people, right? It reveals that God is intimately involved in his people. It's not a distant, uncaring relationship, but like a husband and wife to be close, and it reveals the desire he has to just enter into that with us. But it reveals something else. When he uses that analogy that spiritual unfaithfulness is like sexual unfaithfulness, he's saying that sexuality is huge. See, we miss that. In that when he makes that comparison, he's saying if, if you, when you go out after other gods, it's like sexual unfaithfulness to me. He's saying sexuality is very significant. It's not some minor part. And I can, if I can say it this way, it reveals the glory of sex. That God has made it very, very powerful and very, very important. It's not just a physical act. Mark that. It's not just a sharing of bodily fluids. It's not just the satisfaction of an urge. It is something deep, it is something powerful. It is even something spiritual. Everybody with me? Now watch this. If we go to 1 Corinthians, and the, the, the book of First and Second Corinthians was written to a culture that was probably even worse than our culture in its view of sex and the perversion of sex. And so the Apostle Paul writes very directly to the church and says, hey, you guys need to watch yourselves because don't get wrapped up into that. And here's part of what he says. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? And again, in that culture, that was, it was the whole worship, the perverse religion was all about sex says, may it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says, and now he quotes the Old Testament, the two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee in morality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have of God, and that you are not your own, for you've been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Did you see it? Did you see the significance that the Apostle Paul placed on the act of sexual intimacy? He says there's a oneness that takes place in the act of sex. There is a bonding that takes place in that. There is much more that happens in sex than just some kind of physical response. And so he goes back to Genesis 2. The two become one flesh. Something wonderful, mysterious, something amazing happens at that moment. And we've lost that in our culture. We've so trivialized sex and publicized it that we've lost the significance of what happens in that. Church, we need to pull sex out of the gutter. We need to get it out of the gutter in our minds and place it where God has placed it. Notice in this passage that it singles out sexual sin as uniquely different and consequential. Now that doesn't mean that sexual sin is somehow beyond forgiveness. But this passage is reminding us that, the, that sex is such a sacred act that the consequences of sin in that area are very deep in us and very long lasting because it's not just a physical act. It involves much more than our bodies. It involves our emotions. It even involves us spiritually. 
All right, I found an illustration this week that might help. Suppose that I had a very fine and expensive automobile, like a Rolls Royce or an Austin Martin or a Ford Ranger or something like that. <laughs> Or maybe I had this car, it's a Lamborghini, it costs $4 million. Now there are many ways that I could sin in that car or with that car. Number one, it would be real easy for me to sin with that car by getting on I-5 and hitting 120, 130, 140. I don't know how fast that car will go, but I could sin with that car. I could sin with that car by pulling up to a bank and going in and robbing the bank and having Kim move over into the driver's seat and that would be the getaway car. I could sin with that car. I could go over in front of the school and spin donuts in the grass with that car. <laughs> I could sin in the car with the car. But what if I needed manure for my garden? You know that smelly, ripe chicken manure that works so well, and I go down to the garden center in the middle of the night because I don't want to buy it, and I cut the lock, and I drive this car in there, and I pop open the door, and I just start filling it up with manure to take back to my house. We might consider that a sin against the car. <laughs> Not just a sin with the car because I'm breaking in, I'm stealing something. It's a sin against the car because what I'm doing to it is going to have some lasting consequences that may never be forgotten. Now again, that doesn't mean that sexual sin can't be forgiven. We need to understand that God has made sex such a sacred and glorious act between a husband and a wife that when we sin in that area, it affects us very very, very deeply. And there's many of us here today that know that all too well, do we not? It lingers still. It is forgiven, and we can continue to walk with the Lord, yet we recognize that those choices we made at one point have continued to impact us, and probably always will. So what is the significance of that truth in a very practical way? Does it mean we worship sex and idolize sex as this glorious thing? Does it mean we fear it and demonize it as very dangerous? Neither one. Let's don't go to either one of those extremes. What that means for us is we need to guard sex as a very precious gift from God and keep it in the context that he can fully bless it in. Which brings us to our last point. Sex is good. Sex is great. Sex is glorious. And last, sex is guarded by God because it's so good, because it's so great, and because it's so glorious. So let's move to the end. Hebrews chapter 13. Marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled, for fornicators and adulterers God will judge. So what does it look like and mean to have sex in its proper place? The proper place where sex is to be fully expressed and experienced and enjoyed is in marriage. And marriage, understood biblically, has always been and will always be one man and one woman. Now we're all aware of where this is going in our culture. And I, it's just going to go there, except by God's grace and some huge intervention. But we as the people of God need to keep coming back to his standard. Marriage as God intended it is always one man and one woman. Now throughout biblical history, there are examples of other types of marriages, namely polygamy, one man with many wives, but understand that was never condoned by God. That was never commanded by God, and as you look at those situations, were there not always problems in those situations? Indeed, there were. So this passage says, marriage is to be held in honor among all. Now that word honor, it's the same word used in 1 Peter, talking about the very blood of Christ, that it is precious. Marriage is to be seen as precious, as important, as valuable. 
And then the text goes on to say, at least one of the ways that marriage is honored as the marriage bed is to be undefiled or pure. That phrase has many implications, but no doubt for sure it means that it is in marriage that sex is blessed and where sex is to be enjoyed and experienced. And anything outside of that does not have the blessing of God. Even if it's somehow enjoyable physically, let's not mistake that for somehow the blessing of God in that. It's just where our bodies have been created to go. So then we have two words after that exhortation to honor marriage and and to keep the marriage bed undefiled or pure. It says fornicators and adulterers. Now we don't use those words much anymore. And again, I think that's an indication. Those are strong words. <laughs> I, it never, it, I, it just as interesting to me as I think about ways we refer to people having illicit or immoral sex. It's, it's sleeping together. There's no sleeping going on here. <laughs> They're having an affair. We have softened that so much to make it much more palatable. So this passage talks about when marriage or sex goes outside of marriage, it's fornication. It's, it's a broad Greek word. Uh, it refers to anyone who is involved in illicit, not God-ordained sexual activity. When I say God-ordained, again, we're talking about the marriage bed, the marriage relationship. Adulterers, it's a bit more narrow Greek word, it refers refers to those who are married and have an illicit sexual activity with another married person. So we see that fornication and adultery, and we could go to many other passages that talk about homosexuality, we know all of those have become quite acceptable in our culture. But we have another standard, do we not, church? We have another standard. It's not the cultural standard. We need to live by God's standard. It's a higher standard. And all that to say, God is not a prude. Sex was his idea. And it was a good idea. It was a great idea. It was a glorious idea. And it's a guarded idea in the sense that it has appropriate place where it is fully enjoyed and fully experienced in marriage between a husband and a wife. Let's look at one more passage. This is the will of God, your sanctification. Uh, It's a big word, it means your, your growth in holiness. That is that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel, his body, in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion, like the Gentiles who do not know God. Gentiles, unbelievers. Church, that's just such a clear statement. I mean, we we can't miss the point there. Do you want to know what God's will for us as his people is? Abstain from sexual immorality. That's his will for us. And he has said that to us very clearly in so many places because he knows the dangers of it. He knows the power of sex, the impact of sex. So he says, just don't go there. He doesn't say abstain from sex because sex has its place, right? And what is that place? In marriage with the man and the woman. Don't abstain from sex. Abstain from sexual immorality. Enjoy sex in the right place with that right person. Learn how to possess your body, to control your body, so that you don't just go off like the culture does in lustful passions. And that's what rules our world today. If it feels good, what? That's where we're at. Just because it feels good and God has designed it to feel good doesn't mean we just do it. We keep it in the proper place. Married brothers and sisters, can I exhort you, guard your hearts. Guard your marriages. 
Give proper attention to the gift of sex in your marriage. Enjoy it. Submit to one another in it. It has been given to you to, for pleasure and satisfaction and even to bond you and your spouse even closer together. Single brothers and sisters, guard your hearts. Don't buy the lie. God is not against sex. God is for it. If God's plan for you is marriage, don't settle for anything less than God's best sex. God's best sex is blessed sex in the marriage with your spouse. Don't settle for anything less than that. You'll be disappointed always. Don't take sexual baggage into your marriage that comes from trying to preempt God's plan for you. Now, if God's plan for you is not marriage, then remember, God's grace is surely enough for you in all things as you find your pleasure completely in Christ. Four points. I hope you got them. Sex is good. Sex is great, sex is glorious, sex is guarded. It's God's plan. And we can talk about it honestly because this is our God, amen? The creator God that has put this all in place. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a transformative gospel. It changes us. So I just want to make sure we come back to this truth that, that in our lives, if, if these are areas that we've struggled with or even continue to struggle with, the gospel of Jesus Christ is powerful enough to cleanse and to empower you to move ahead. As we admit it honestly and repent and turn from it, he meets us there. Jesus meets us at that point, and then continues to transform our thinking so that we don't get wrapped up with where the culture is going. Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, would you read this out loud with me, please? Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. God's will for his people is always good. It's always the best. Understand, that's true in the area of our sexual lives. His plan is the best plan. He doesn't want us to settle for anything less than the best in every area of our lives if we'll just trust him and turn to him. Pray with me, please. Father, thank you for loving us. So for, for showing that to us in so many wonderful ways. So, Lord, as we think about this, this topic, and um, Lord, we just want to run to you and say thank you for loving us. We revel in that. We want to soak up your love so that, Lord, we could live holy as you would desire us to. Lord, I pray your spirit will bring even healing today, that your spirit would bring restoration and change and even repentance. Lord, areas of our lives that we've fallen short of, we just repent. Thank you, Jesus, for covering that on the cross for us.